Thank you, Claire. So the uh, discovery of the activated jack stat signaling that is of course associated with the jack 2 v 6 and 7F mutation, but also with MPL and carreticulin mutation, led to design at the beginning a quite simplistic model whereby this activated signaling pathway was per se responsible for the, the main features of these disorders that are the clonal expansions and the consequences that are associated with this clonal expansion and the characteristics of the disease that are the enlargement of the spleen, the risk of thrombosis, eventually the development of fibrosis, and of course the impact also on, on survival. And it was also thought that this abnormal signaling by Jack Stat was key for the transformation of a chronic phase into an acute disorder. And so, moving from this, a simplistic postulate was that by targeting efficiently the Jack Stat signaling, you might be able to effectively control all of these aspects of the disease that are the clonal proliferation, the consequences of, the, uh, of this clonal proliferation, and also the, to impact on the leukemic transformation. And of course, this was supported by a number of JAK2 inhibitors that have been developed in clinical trials. And as Claire has already shown, we are now dealing with just one JAK inhibitor that has been approved for the treatment of intermediate and high-risk patients with malofibrosis and for second-line in patients with polycythemia vera, that is ruxolitinib. All uh, the other JAK inhibitors have failed, or a, a said failure such as fedratinib that was stopped just before applying for approval to the FDA, or memelotinib and pacritinib that, as mentioned before, we are still waiting for updated information about the future of, of these drugs that might have a specific setting of patients where they might be applied as compared to ruxolitinib. And so these data have been largely discussed in the previous talks, but I just use them to make the background on which to uh, think about the future of managing these disorders. So we know from these phase three studies that ruxolitinib is able to produce, to induce responses in the spleen in about 50% of the patients and a similar proportions may, may have quality of life improvement at, uh, during treatment, but at five years, about half of these patients are still maintaining a spleen response. And so the, there is a, great, a significant proportion of patients who lose the response to the, in the spleen over the time, and some of these also lose the, re, the response in terms of quality of life improvement. Then the expectation that treatment with JAK2 inhibitors might produce molecular remission has been largely failing because only one-third of patients might have a decrease in the JAK2 allelic burden greater than 20%, but what is the ultimate significance, meaning of, of this reduction is still to be understood, and complete molecular remissions that have been reported and ca well characterized are very, very rare. And in the previous talk of this morning, it has been shown that the uh, impact, I think you have shown, or if not, I, I, okay, I, I will say on uh, your behalf, that the impact of ruxolitinib on fibrosis is quite weak because at best we can see some stabilization of fibrosis and only a minority of patients have really improvement on fibrosis. And as mentioned before by Serge, it is known that treatment with ruxolitinib does not increase the rate but does not prevent at all leukemic transformation. And of course this happens, treatment happens at the expenses of some adverse events that are on target side effects of ruxolitin, such as anemia, thrombocytopenia, and also infections that are the expression of the immunomodulating properties of, of the drug. And what about polycythemia vera where the drug is approved? Well here the drug has been pretty well tolerated. It has been shown to be effective in controlling the disease. There has been some signal in terms of vascular events, but unfortunately we, this was not and was, could be hardly be a statistically powered end point. And however, even here, there was no clear impact on the uh, allelic burden in this disease. And Claire already discussed about the impact on survival, and so I will skip this slide because I'm perfectly online with her conclusions. 
And we know that patients receiving ruxolitinib may develop resistance to the drug and some mechanisms that are the basis of this resistance have been clarified in terms of other Jack family members that take play the that can take the place of JAK2 and continue to signal, but we have to acknowledge that we have no clear clue to what is the mechanism for resistance to ruxolitinib, and especially if we can prevent it and if we can predict it in the, in the patients. And so this is the background on which to look to, into the future of therapeutics for MPNs, and I selected these four points that have been also largely discussed in these three days. One is about early intervention in these disorders. The second is about combinations, new strategies for using these drugs, and finally the perspectives of new molecules. Why early intervention? Because it's clear that especially myelofibrosis is a progressive disease. This data from the Mayo Clinic clearly show how patients that are seen one year after the, those who are seen at diagnosis have significantly higher rate of uh, abnormalities, hematological abnormalities and clinical abnormalities, clinical signs, symptoms, that clearly show that the disease is quite rapidly progressing. So this is the basis for thinking about early intervention in, in these patients and we, we have some evidence that this makes sense and this is feasible because there are data from a couple of studies, one in UK, one is uh, the, the JUMP study, that included patients in, in earlier phases in intermediate to one uh, group of the IPSS score. And these patients responded pretty well and they tolerated the pretty well the, the treatment, of course even better than patients in an advanced stage of, of the disease. And we know from the analysis of the comfort data that there is a correlation between the spleen volume and the risk of, of dying. And so this is the basis for hypothesizing that early treatment with the JAK inhibitors might result in better control of the disease and also possibly slowing of the, uh, the disease itself, but this clearly requires a randomized trial to support this hypothesis. And the trial is the one that Claire presented yesterday, and we are very sad that this trial could not be pursued because of just technical reasons in terms of slowing enrollment, but this trial was based on early patients, patients with early disease who were selected on the basis of their uh, prognostically negative mutation status, and the end point of this trial was to demonstrate that early treatment with ruxolitinib might slow the progression of the disease. And so this is a list of new molecules to move to the second point that is quite similar. Something is missing, something is in addition to that presented by Claire. So this is a long list of drugs and there are possibly others that are coming in the near future. So these drugs might be used alone, but uh, there is a lot of interest in, in trying to combine these drugs with JAK inhibitors. And of course, the reason to do this is double. The first is that we know that dose maximization of the JAK inhibitors is limited by the on-target effects on the hematopoietic system. And the second is that the uh, impact of these drugs on the disease does, did not provide uh, in a convincing way a disease-modifying activity. And so the hypothesis is that if we combine two drugs, we might maintain the same effects on, of ruxolitin most spleen and symptoms, reducing the toxicity and possibly increasing the impact of the therapy as disease-modifying uh, treatment for the disease. And this, of course, comes from the observations that follow the discovery of the JAK mutation, that JAK mutation itself is not able to explain all of the as abnormalities that are associated with MPNs. There are several other targets, possible targets for treatment, and these are related to the epigenetic regulation, to the spliceosome, but also to other signaling pathways. And so one of these signaling pathways where we have been working in the last uh, few years is represented by the PI3K mTOR signaling pathway. 
And well before the introduction of JEC2 inhibitor of ruxolitinib, we uh, started a phase one to trial with Everolimus, that is an mTOR inhibitor, and we showed that this drug was able to produce reduction of enlarged spleen volume and improvement of symptoms in a similar way to ruxolitinib, even if less potent, clearly, than ruxolitinib. And so we went on to try to test other uh, drugs that are acting on this signaling pathway. And this is our last work that combined a, a combined a different PI3K and mTOR inhibitors with ruxolitinib. And you can just look at this, that, that is quite uh, easy to, to follow. This is a spleen of mice that are controlled mice, JAK2 disease uh, mice. These are patients who have treated with ruxolitinib, uh, sorry, with um, Everolimus. These are mice that have been treated with ruxolitinib. These are mice that have been treated with API3K inhibitors. And when we use combination of ruxolitinib, PI3K, and RAT, that is Everolimus mTOR inhibitor, you can see that there is really a gradient towards an impressive decrease of, of the spleen volume. And we were very surprised by the changes in the histopathology in, in the mice, both in the bone marrow and in the spleen, where you can see that there is almost a, a normal morphology of the spleen and of the bone marrow. And so these are preclinical data that might support the use of combining different drugs that target different signaling pathways. Unfortunately, we have to say that these preclinical data have not turned yet in clinical uh, data, in clinical results. In this combination trial where ruxolitinib was used in association with BKM, patients did not overshow uh, an increased response as compared to ruxolitinib alone, and the same unfortunately happened for the HDAC inhibitor panobinostat or for LDE that is an in inhibitor of the AGOC pathway. And of course, the same degree of uh, efficacy was at the expenses of some increased toxicity. So we have to acknowledge that at present the idea of combination with the current drugs that has been used till now is not supported by clinical data. Of course, this does not mean that this is not a good idea, and so we can go ahead. And this is a trial of combination trial that is, uh, that is still ongoing that associate ruxolitinib with this inhibitor of the PIM kinases and the inhibitor of the cycline-dependent kinases 4 and 6. And the Preclinical support to this combination trial is represented by mice that are treated with the, combina with the combination of drugs have significant greater reduction in spleen weight, but especially presented a significant reduction in the allelic burden, what is not commonly seen even in this model uh, with other drugs. So this is a combinational trial ongoing. There are several others that might be designed, but the feeling is that right now, we, we just heard about the rationale for using these agents in the leukemic transformation, but in the chronic phase, the feeling is that these drugs are more uh, used based on a shopping attitude. That means I have this drug, why don't try it in association with Ruxolin? But a clear uh, preclinical support is, is, is lacking. Sorry. So other approaches is to uh, think about alternative targets. And I think that this is a nice model. This is momelotinib. Momelotinib was shown to be uh, active similar or quite similar to Ruxo, not in terms of potency, of course, in, against splenomegaly and symptoms, but a proportion of patients, not an negligible proportion of patients, all had improvement of anemia. And this was quite uh, difficult to, under, to understand because this is a JAK2 inhibitor and JAK2 signaling is essential for erythropoiesis and thrombopoiesis. And now it has been shown that this impact, this effect of momelotinib of anemia might be mediated by a different target, and this is the active NA receptor type 1, that through modulation of epsidin might result indeed in an increase in a positive effect on erythropoiesis. And we have already discussed about the use of ruxolitinib in, in alternative setting. The alternative setting is transplantation. We know that patients who are transplanted with big spleen have worse prognosis, have delayed engraftment, 
And so the European Leukemia Net and the European Bone Marrow Transplant Consensus Conference support the use of ruxolitinib as pretransplant bridge because it might reduce the spleen volume, it might improve the conditions of the patient thereby resulting in improved outcome of the transplantation. This remains to be assessed because there are trials that also highlighted some safety issues, as Claire pointed out before, but these trials are ongoing and we are expected some answers from these trials. New molecules, well, I think that uh, there, there might be, the story of CML is telling us a lot of, of things, so we, we might predict that even for Jack inhibitor we might follow the, the same path, the first evidence that this might happen, I'm using this might because this is the reality right now, is this type 2 JAK inhibitor that has been shown to be very active in uh, murine models and in in vitro cells, also in cells that have been exposed to ruxolitinib and have be, be became refractory to, to the drug itself, but unfortunately right now there is no planet clinical trial with this uh, agent. And then there's a lot of uh, efforts to identify alternative targets within the JAK2 molecules because we know that some uh, key residues for the mo of the molecules are essential for a JAK2 mutated protein activation that might distinguish the mutated from the wild type protein. And of course, this is an avenue for further development and experimentation. And then there are other drugs that are being tested. One of these is the inhibitor of telomerase imetilstat that has been shown to be especially active against megakaryocyte proliferation, abnormal megakaryocyte, not the normal ones. And a, a phase one, phase two study has been published recently in patients with malofibrosis showing partial responses in about 20% of the patient and also some evidence of improvement of the bone marrow histopathology. There's a phase two study that, that is ongoing, but the, phase, the study is now halted and we are waiting the results of this uh, partially uh, accomplished trial. PRM151 uh, is a recombinant human pectinaxin 2. It's a drug that might be uh, effective in reducing the fibrosis. And here there, there is a biological background that has been produced by Serge uh, Vestovsic in terms of the activity of the drug because it targets some key cells elements in the production of malofibrosis. And in this xenograft transplant mouse model, the delivery of the uh, inhibitor was associated also with survival of mice and clear evidence of reduction of fibrosis and also some evidence of control of hematological values. And so there are preliminary results with this inhibitor that are quite uh, reassuring and, and well uh, predicting what will the future of this drug and a trial is ongoing in patients who are who were ruxolitinib resistance. But if we come to the original question of this presentation, how I feel where the uh, field is going, well, I, I, this is my feeling. And this is a famous shot from a movie from Federico Fellini. This is the grandfather in this movie, and he is walking in the fog in the uh, Pianura Padana, that, that is a part of Italy where fog is so common, close to Milan, but not only. And he's walking, he sees nothing around himself and asks, where am I? I don't see to be anywhere. And then he adds, and if death is like this, it's not a good job, I don't like it. So this is the feeling where we are right now. So we, ha we have a very important drug that has changed the life of many of our patients, but we want to look forward, we, we need to look forward. And so these are just some points to conclude on how we might move towards. So we are all convinced that we need other effective JAK2 inhibitors because there are patients who fail, very few, under oxolitinib, who lose the response. There are patients who do not tolerate well the drugs, and so we need alternative choices. We also need to test new hypotheses in patients with malafibrosis, and the early phases are one of these uh, possible new hypotheses. We need to think about the, the use of ruxolitinib also in patients with the T, and Serge just learned, uh, told me this morning that the, the 
there is a trial of comparison in 80 patients of ruxolitinib with anagrelite in patients who are uh, resistant or refractory to hydroxyurea. And so these are important trials, but of course we, we need to, to have the results and see the balance between efficacy and uh, safety or, and toxicity of, of these drugs. We need to test novel agents, possibly based on a rational, on preclinical uh, evidences, but I think that we also need to think what is the reality of patients that are now conventionally treated with ruxolitinib. In particular, I think that the, uh, we, we all together should define what is resistance or refractoriness to ruxolitinib because the next clinical trials will be largely in patients who are resistant or refractory to ruxolitinib, and this is not a common definition yet. We need also to have trials that validate hard points one is survival in malofibrosis, one might be thrombosis in polycythemia vera, and, and so on. And I think that all of these points require even a stronger interaction between academia and pharma companies because we really need to understand how to move very fast the, the, this field because patients need uh, even stronger responses and better drugs than right now. So I thank for your attention, and I'd like to thank all the people in the lab and all the national and international collaborators. Thank you.